Welcome, everybody. Burrows and Burbs, Season 4, Episode 134. We're talking affordable housing, workforce housing. And I've got special guests on today. Peter Neal from GSP, REI. Say hello, Peter. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. And where are you? Where are you from now? I am calling in from the suburbs of Philadelphia. Awesome. And I've got James Nelson of Avison Young. Say hello, James. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to have this conversation. Love the title of the show and reporting in from the studio here at 535th Avenue. Awesome. Down Manhattan. Awesome. And I want to say hello to my co-host, co-pilot, Roberto. Where are you, Roberto? I'm on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I'm very excited about this. I kind of want to understand why is this important? Literally, why is this important? Why do we even need to talk about this? But I know that uh, I'm going to learn. So this is really good for me. Everybody is buzzing about affordable housing. So this it has been a long time in coming, this show. First, I want to thank our sponsors. We've got Grace Farms. There's a shot of the famous river building on 80 acres in New Canaan, Connecticut. They just did a uh, summit on sustainable development. Pretty soon, they're going to be um, celebrating Earth Day. And I want you to go up there, enjoy the campus. And then I want you to... Uh, buy their tea and coffee and support their mission. And you see there, Earth Day 2024, they're doing planet versus plastics. Buy one, get one on select black teas this week. And with that, let's get right into the show. If you type in the word affordable housing into Google, affordable housing charts, you see that everybody is talking about affordable housing and nobody seems to agree on the definition. So I asked two experts and here's GSPREI. What, what do they do? They are real estate investment managers and they know something about affordable housing. So we've asked co-founder Peter Neal to talk to us today. And our second guest, as I said before, James Nelson. He's the principal and head of Tri-State Investment Sales for Avison Young. And when I looked up their portfolio, I saw that it was highly concentrated in New York City with a couple other investments such as out in Huntington, Long Island. So we get a little bit of uh, the perspective of uh, investors and experts. I'm going to hit stop share. And with that, let's begin. James Nelson, what is affordable housing and why does it matter? Well, well, it, it's uh, fundamental, right, for, for us all to have housing and um, uh, a place to live. And it's been, I don't know if you all planned it this way, but the timing of the show is unbelievable because here in New York, because it has been all the talk right now. Uh, up in Albany, uh, there was a whole slew of, of new legislation that's being passed as we speak right now to really with the hopes of creating new housing, but also preserving some of the existing housing. And uh, I'm sure we can get to that. Um, but to answer your question about what what is affordable housing, uh, why is it important? And I, I think to kind of, first of all, uh, state that there's all different levels of affordability. And, and sometimes we talk about affordable with a capital A, you hear it, capital A affordable and um little a affordable. And so are we talking about housing that's subsidized, uh, which would be the kind of the capital A affordable uh, and all that housing that is, um, you know, supported by subsidies at the city, state, federal levels. And then we talk about housing on the whole. And when we talk about workforce housing uh, and just overall affordability levels um, and, and how do we, I, I think everybody can agree on the need uh, for more affordable housing across the board, all spectrums, right? So when we start to get really technical, we can talk about the different levels of affordability. So in New York, what that means is what percentage of the annual median income. So a lot of the discussions that were going on with Albany and creating new uh, tax abatements for new development are talking about, okay, what level of AMI, right? And how are we going to create different bands of that affordability? But I'd make the case that, you know, look, we need more housing of all um, affordability levels, right? And so um, 
in New York City, just with the population growth we've had, if you listen to the city, if you look listen to the real estate board, we have a need for between 500,000 to 530,000 new housing units to kind of keep up with that demand by 2030. And last year, okay, where there wasn't any subsidies available, there was only permits for 10,000 new units. You know, so you all do the math. If we're only producing 10,000 housing units per year here in New York and we need to get to a half a million, it's going to take us a really long way. So, you know, we're cautiously optimistic that some of the things that were decided on and we're still waiting for the details uh, from Albany are going to help create that. So I'm really looking forward to getting into this conversation and, and figuring out how we can create more affordable housing for all. James, why do we need 530,000 units? People coming in, old housing yeah. stock being no longer, you know, usable? Yeah, it, it, it's a combination of things. First of all, I think it's a fallacy you hear, especially after COVID, there was kind of this, um, I, I guess you hear people talking about uh, people leaving New York, a mass going down to the South. And I'm, I'm not saying that there weren't, you know, people who moved to Florida, but the reality is if you just look at the population count, it's it's growing here. And uh, without getting too technical about New York rent regulation housing, there's roughly about 3 million housing units here in the city, okay? And about a third of them are rent regulated, okay? And with some of the changes that took place in 2019, where uh, those units, those rents were kind of frozen in time, if, if you're one of the lucky recipients who has one of those units, right? which are not means tested, okay? So maybe you inherited that Central Park apartment from your grandmother who was lucky enough to get one of those rent control apartments, right? You're probably not leaving that unit, right? So if you have a million of those units set aside where people are holding on to them, right? And then you have new people coming to the city, if we're not creating new housing stock, right? Just to keep up population, you know, we're not going to be able to provide. So it, it's uh, th there is a, a huge housing shortage uh, right now that, that certainly needs to be addressed. I've heard three different ways to address affordable housing so far in the conversation. One is subsidies to get them built. I've heard the second one is subsidies that we give people to rent units. Uh, so we either give it to the renter, we either give it to the developer, the subsidy, or the third way you just mentioned was regulations, where we where we write a new law and we either freeze the rents or we write a law, um, a zoning law. So there's a third way through regulation. Which is the method that uh, you're seeing most common or most commonly talked about this election year as a strategy for getting it done? So in 2019, the... Um... Housing Stabilization Tenant Protection Act uh, basically took the approach to freeze the regulated units. Okay, so the way regulated housing worked in New York was once a tenant vacated, it used to be before 2019 that you could go in and do work and you could raise the uh, legal registered rent to a point where it was now fair market. Okay, so the, the fear from um, a lot of the elected officials is we're losing this rent regulated housing stock because uh, a tenant vacates, it's getting renovated and then it's fair market and it's no longer affordable. So the approach after 2019 was just to freeze these units in time where you can't raise the rent. OK, um, I'm in, in, and I was going to add to your, your three ways, which was a good summary, that there's a fourth where I'm really, you know, a, a, a big proponent of. I think the issue is we need more, right? The issue is we do not have enough housing. If we just snapped our fingers today and all of a sudden we have 500,000 new housing units, right? What do you think is going to happen to the rents, right? And and we know because we already saw this happen in 2020. In after COVID where, you know, suddenly people left the city and half the units, maybe not half, but you know, 10, 20 percent of people leave the city, they go find a you know place to live, you know, with family or you know, where else you know they might have gone to. We saw rents immediately drop, right? Because we're talking about supply and demand. So I think what's so important right now is that we need to figure out how to create new housing. And it really does have to be a public-private partnership because 
the reason why developers are not building new rental housing right now, especially affordable, right, is land is going to cost whatever the market's going to bear, right? But if I'm now taking that risk where I'm borrowing money, where rates are, you know, very high today, right, not just for buying an apartment or a house, but also to borrow for a construction project, right, and I'm going to build this new building, and then 25 to 30 percent of my revenue goes to pay for real estate taxes, right? You start doing the math on that. And if you have to pay full taxes day one, numbers just don't work. In some in some areas, if you gave me the land for free, the numbers don't work, right? So that's why there's been so much talk. You all probably hear about 421A, you know, if you've heard about that in New York. And that was a program that worked, right? It got tens of thousands of units built, right, on the tax roll. And then you start getting that tax abatement and your taxes phase in over 35 years, right? So now, and that that program expired in 21. And what happens after the program expires? Land sales drop 75%, right? And so rental development, affordable development on hold, right? So now, finally, we've seen the, uh, Albany reintroduce, New York State introduce what's now going to be called 485X, which is going to be a replacement for that uh, program. But now we have to see, okay, well, where are the levels of affordability, right? Because I'm still going to have to pay what I'm going to have to pay for land. I'm running the numbers. It's it's more expensive to build today, interest rate costs. And now if I have to provide a certain amount of affordable housing in the development, I have to see if the numbers actually work to go do this. So that, that's going to be the big question that we're going to, we're going to find out very shortly. Can you describe the basic differences between the 421A and the 485X? So the levels of affordability in this new program are going to be much greater. And one of the biggest criticisms that 421A received was, yes, uh, and there was different options, right? There was option A, B, C, D, but the developers all gravitated towards option C, okay? Option C, what was that? Yes, 30% of the units were affordable, but those were at 130% of AMI, of the annual median income, okay? So what that means is that's not, you know, deeply affordable units, right? Those are, um, you know, you could call kind of middle income, you know, that would be like a $2,800 a month, one bedroom, right? You know, better than what probably you'd try to find in the city right now, but not deeply affordable. So the criticism was you're not really creating deeply affordable units if everyone's going for this option C. We need to, you know, cancel this out. What we really need is that 80% of AMI, that 60%. And that's what the new 45X is going to do is it's going to require greater levels of affordability. Peter, you are an investor. He's just talked to you, uh, talked to us about a very bleak, uh, landscape. Why does it make sense to be in a real estate investor in the affordable housing space? Sure. Well, as I'm sitting here listening to James, I'm thinking it's a lot of the reason we do what we do with single family affordable housing and utilizing Section 8 vouchers instead of uh, HAP contracts and things like that, where the subsidy for us is tied to the tenant uh, and not tied to the building. And then, uh, you know, our focus on redevelopment and not developing new, you know, new units, that kind of thing is so a lot of the things he's saying, I completely 100% agree with. And it's one of the reasons we do what we do and, and uh, why our strategy is structured the way it is, because it gives us flexibility um, to kind of go back to the, the initial question of what is affordable housing. We look at it the same way that HUD looks at it. You know, so the affordable housing is when a tenant is paying no more than 30 percent of their gross monthly income towards their rent. And that could be achieved through a subsidy or it could be achieved naturally with no subsidy. So we kind of use the term affordable and workforce housing because most people, you know, most investors look at affordable as a, there's a subsidy connected to it. Um, not always the case, but a lot of people tend to, when you say affordable housing, think subsidized housing. 
and then workforce housing it, there's going to be it's going to be oriented towards people who are working uh and that have you know a job and you know the, they want the property to be located in a way that they can easily um you know get to where they're working and you know easy transportation and things like that um but typically workforce housing you know the, the average investor doesn't think subsidy uh they just think you know kind of middle income and something that's affordable something that's not you know naturally affordable uh, and something that's not luxury Where's the opportunity if I put $10 million or $100 million into your fund right now and said, go ahead, deploy it? I want yeah, to re it so it, instead of building it, it's buying it. So it's buying, you know, dil uh, dilapidated, uh, blighted homes in areas that are trending positively. Uh, so we watch crime maps and things like that, and we tend to look for value generators, so hospitals and certain business districts, and you know, just access to transportation. And in the markets that we invest in, primarily Baltimore and Philadelphia, uh, a lot of you guys in New York have, have come down to Philadelphia over the last couple of years. It's made it a, a little bit harder to find good deals. Um, but Baltimore, you know, the, the secret isn't quite out yet. You know, it gets a lot of bad rep and from a national perspective. But there's a ton of demand, uh, not just for housing, but there's uh, for rental housing, but also for resale. We see a pretty strong resale market, um, probably now more than there ever was in, in the Baltimore market. So it's buying delinquent, you know, uh, dilapidated, you know, blighted type properties, uh, and then redeveloping. Yeah, you know, this way we're use, utilizing investor capital uh, for the acquisitions and the construction costs. We're not depending on state or uh, government funding in any way that. that that a normal, you know, a multifamily type affordable housing developer would need to go back to what James was saying to make the project affordable, uh, because their land cost is going to be as much as it is, and the building costs as much as it as it is, and uh, maybe having to work with unions. And Are things you competing like that the with city. Blackstone and the rest for all those? No, uh, we're we're competing with uh, smaller nonprofits and mom and pop type uh, investors, you know, that are bu buying a few homes a year, redeveloping. And and then either selling them or, or keeping them as a rental. Um, you know, there certainly is some institutions or I guess I would say nonprofits that receive institutional money that are operating in the space. And there are a few institutional backed firms that have started to buy more workforce and affordable housing. So like not invitation homes or uh, American homes for rent or like some of those companies that invest primarily in the South and, you know, nicer you know, neighborhoods, uh, you know, with good school districts and, and, you know, all those kind of location, location, location type investments. Um, but there there's over the years, there has become more institutional type competition in the workforce and affordable housing space. But for the most part, we tend to compete more with, you know, smaller, you know, mom and pop type investors that uh, go in and look for value adds and, you know, look to keep you know, a small rental portfolio. Um, but we tend to go, yeah, even them, they don't like those fully blighted properties where they have to go in and put $100,000 worth of work into the place. They look more for the value add type properties where it's kind of, they can go in, it's small renovation, lipsticks type stuff, and, and then lease it out. Uh, we do all of our construction in house. So our, our bread and butter is really those fully dilapidated properties that we could pick up south of 30,000, put 80 to 100,000 into them, and then resell them or, or, you know, ideally keep them as a rental. Is there an opportunity to, for example, if you have a house that's dilapidated where the zoning will allow for a multi family structure? Can you raise the building and create? create? Yeah. And do you do that? We don't, uh, you know, th that that would involve a lot more, you know, dealing with the city and with zoning and getting uh, possibly zoning relief or permitting and things like that. You see that more in Philadelphia than you do in Baltimore. Uh, in Baltimore, th there's in both cities and in all pretty much major cities, there's going to be um, city provided uh, affordable housing. And that tends to be multifamily. Uh, so there's a huge demand for single family homes. You know, a lot of people that receive these subsidies, they have families, you know, like a one bedroom or a studio and a multifamily apartment is not ideally, you know, it's not their best situation. You know what I mean? So we see the demand and what we're, and we can, you know, go in and renovate a property very quickly. That's already single family and keeping it single family. 
Whereas we've certainly looked at opportunities uh, to redevelop uh, old commercial buildings, warehouses, um, even dilapidated retail or apartments and things like that. Um, but it provides, it, it's just a little bit of a longer process compared to for us where we could usually have a property cash flowing again in under 90 days. Uh, you know, that that would just it would be a little bit more red tape connected to that. But in Philadelphia, where it's harder to find deals, you do see investors where the zoning allows for you to build up and, and build out and all that kind of stuff. You see that it's much more common in, in that market. So, so if, from a standpoint, I was making an analogy to just buying something. Is your inventory like is your are the possibilities, the opportunities hard to find? Not in Baltimore. No, no. You could drive around Baltimore. There's a lot of vacant homes, you know, and, and there's a huge demand for them. Uh, it's it's amazing. You know, I mean, how many vacant properties there are when you drive around and, you know, there's a lot of construction going on, too. So it's not like, uh, you know, a completely untapped. Nobody knows about it or something like that. I mean, there's certainly people that are buying and developing in the city on for, from a commercial standpoint and a residential standpoint. But in Philadelphia, it, it certainly is harder. And there certainly has been institutional backed investors that have come in and bought up a lot. And, you know, it, New York money coming down to Philadelphia, they saw the margins in Philly and they were amazing compared to what you could do. Uh, and we as Philadelphia, like all, we're based in Philadelphia. That's where we grew up and all. Uh, we went to Baltimore and probably felt similar to how um, how New York investors felt when they came to Philadelphia. I mean, it was just it's the. the so, so where does the Baltimore people go then? Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> all over the place. I mean, Washington D.C. and uh, they probably come to Philadelphia. It depends on what you have a stomach for, you know, so, and, and what you want to do. So, what happens in New York City? What happens in Greenwich, Connecticut? What happens in New Canaan, where there are no blighted properties and there's not really a whole lot of opportunity? Um, what is the lesson learned? I will say that California thinks that the answer is uh, through zoning regulations and allowing affordable uh, accessory dwelling units everywhere. And in so doing, they're saying, we're going to spread the pain. We're going to spread the opportunity across every neighborhood. Everybody's going to be, basically, what do they call it? Upzoned. So that's one way of uh, adding affordability in an expensive neighborhood. Have we learned any other methods besides upzoning or adding more density to an expensive neighborhood. Sure. Okay. So so Greenwich and a lot of these um, cities that have not or towns that have not been able to produce the necessary affordable housing, in many cases, the state is stepping in. And if you all look up the term builder's remedy, what's happening now is that a lot of these town cities are getting pressure where the state's saying, you're not keeping up with demand, you're not supplying enough affordable housing. And so we are gonna now supersede your zoning, right? And so, you know, these aren't massive, these aren't 50 story projects, but even going up and down the post road in Connecticut, you start seeing a lot of rental development. You say, okay, well, I haven't seen this before. What's this all about? And it's not that the projects are necessarily fully affordable, but in some cases, in whatever the threshold it is to satisfy that builder's remedy, whether it's 20% or so, these projects are now all of a sudden getting um, approved because, again, the, the state is bypassing some of the, the local uh, zoning regulations. So that is happening. But uh, I do, um, to comment just on what you were talking about in California, and I, I had uh, Sean Demartier uh, on my podcast, he's in San Diego doing that exact thing where uh, San Diego has said, we're going to give more generous zoning for uh, ADU, uh, um, uh, accessory dwelling units, right, to help tackle that that need. So, look, it's going to take creativity. We're seeing that in New York City as well. I know there was a big debate. I don't know if you were following about whether or not you should make basement apartments legal, right? And so that's, you know back and forth on, is that a good thing to do? Uh, also parking regulations. Uh, there's, you wanna build a new project in New York for a while, there was very you know large parking requirements. And now our mayor uh, with city planning and they've got a new proposal out called the city of yes, right? They wanna incentivize uh, development. And so they're saying, why do we need parking, right? You don't need parking if you live in the city, right? So 
definitely changing. I think everybody's trying to solve for this and whether it's subsidy, whether it's more flexible zoning. I think another thing that, that Albany uh, just passed was there has actually been a cap on how much residential density that you can put anywhere in, in New York City. So zoning here in New York City is determined by the city, but the state kind of oversees everything and they put this cap across the entire city for residential only to say that you can't build more than 12 times the the, the floor air ratio. So if you take that lot area uh, and you multiply it by 12, that's the most residential density that you could receive. And they're finally saying we're doing away with this cap. And they've talked about the ability to go up to 15 times, 18 times. Again, if you're going to do that, the trade-off is going to be that a quarter of that has to be affordable. So, um, but yes, it, it, everybody's focused on this. Uh, there used to be this mentality of, um, you know, nimbyism, right? Not in my backyard. And now what you're hearing is YIMBY, yes, in my backyard, where, okay, we need to figure out a way, you know, we have a, a housing affordability crisis. How are we going to address this? And again, if you're living in the city and you don't like the idea of a 30 or 40 story building, you know, going up next to you, and I'll caveat that by saying, yes, historic districts, landmarks, that's a great thing to preserve some of our architectural gems. But if you're in a high density area adjacent to, you know, subway transportation, you know, we're not going to solve this problem by building horizontally, right? You have to be willing to go vertically. And I think finally the narrative has changed. So sorry, that's a really I might have gone off on a little bit of a tangent. No, you got no. me started on Different Greenwich, and I, I, and I keep coming back to, to New York City. It. But that's I, I I live in Connecticut, but I I spend uh, you know I do the bulk of my work here in New York. So. I think it gets to the heart of it. I think that you know it's really tough to pull out the checkbook and write a check and just subsidize the rents and subsidize the development. And a lot of us are saying that it's going to be much easier to approach this through zoning where I can just get, and I can be equal, I can be fair, I can basically paint the a zoning change across, as you say, the entire city. I can lift the, lift the cap and the entire city is my oyster. So I think this gets right to the heart of, um, in this election year, uh, why it's become an, a hot topic and the kinds of mechanisms that we're exploring to address it. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of misconceptions around what relief, what the zoning relief would look like and what it would do. I, I think anytime there's change and anytime people mention affordable housing, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of kind of ideas that come to people's head. And, uh, you know, I, I think if they could fight against just some of the misconceptions um, with like people, what? well, you know, the tenants and the people that come along with it, you know what I mean? That's usually the biggest one. You know what I mean? People, why don't they want it in their backyard? Not only the tenants, but also all of the, um, the transportation and the parking and the traffic. And, you know, is it going to increase ta you know, are they going to have to increase taxes because they need more police and fire and uh, larger school districts and things like that. So just kind of having a, an open dialogue and getting that information. You're, you're out saying that it's poor people, inviting poor people well, into people, sir, my yeah. backyard is yeah. scary for a lot of people. That's certainly an element of it. And, uh, and same with uh, just all the if you have more people in a certain area because they've are allowing accessory dwellings and they're creating, you know, they're allowing density. to build up now it's more density. I mean, so, so now, you know, like James was saying, the what's the parking situation going to look like? What's the, my, my commute going to look like? What's the traffic going to look like? And then are my taxes going to increase because now, because now we need more fire. We need more police. We need, you know, more emergency people because you have more people. Now the police force should be bigger and the schools need to be bigger. So I think it's, it's the not in my backyard isn't just, oh, I don't want poor people near me. It's a greater it's a greater uh, story as well. I mean, so I think getting more information out there where, 
hey, if we do this, if we do provide zoning relief and we do allow for these certain things, here's realistically what's to expect from it. And I do think it's important to add to the conversation. I think we're doing this a lot in Philadelphia where they're investing in the transportation because in the built environment, there's only going to be so much zoning relief you could do and there only can be so much congestion. So investing in transportation, making it easier for people to get around the city, to get outside of the city, um, that allows allows for developers to go to other areas that aren't as developed and and you know don't have as much demand maybe right now because of the the transportation because it's not as easy to get to the city or to get to employment and things like that so i think that's an important piece to this whole story as well as you know just making it easier to get around these cities and you know making it cleaner and safer and all that kind of stuff as well i have a question for paul stone i know paul is uh his well say hello paul hey how you doing Paul's job is to look at places like New Canaan, where I am, and James is in Greenwich. Look at New Canaan, Greenwich, and figure out how much uh, density he needs in a development uh, in order to make it pencil out. So can you talk to me, Paul, about um, the fact that we have got this, a whole lot of uh, two-story buildings in towns like Greenwich and in New Canaan, and, what, and how big do the buildings need to be in order for an affordable housing unit to pencil out at 30% affordable. Well, and that's just it, John. And, you know, just step back for a second and just say everything that um, James and Peter have been saying the last few months, I wholeheartedly agree. I think they're, you know, in the trenches. They see, um, you know, they're on the ground, boots on the ground, and they see what what's causing the problem and and how it's being reacted to. And, and the uh, calculations that developers like myself have to go through um, to look at it. And I think uh, one of you touched on it earlier, which is that the land cost is, is something uh, as, as a basis, that's certainly a starting point. <clears throat> and that is, you know, factors large um, to begin with, but then, you know, what would the end product look like and how much density can you get in there? Because the state building laws that override local zoning, the 8, 830G laws here in Connecticut, um, it's a 30% rule. So the 30% is sort of sort of the loss leader on that. And the 70% market rate need to make up for that. So each one is individual and is different. But um, to your to answer your question, John, you need that density to make the whole thing work, right? And and you do want it to be downtown. We actually have um, three that uh, were in appeal on the state level here in New Canaan, um, and they're all walkable. And you know, you you want that. That's the kind of thing you're looking for. Um, but it has, you know, at its core, something that you know it, it is like the amenities that are for it. It is largely its walkability and everything that a downtown has to offer. So. It needs to work for uh, the developers. Um, and to an earlier point that James uh, was making is it comes down to the economics of supply and demand. I think that's exactly what it is. When you look at it, housing, the housing industry is one of the only, if not the only industry that has an artificially constrained supply, right? In other words, <clears throat> the local zoning um, really is, is the, control point on that. And, you know, for a lot of reasons, it's been very restrictive and has artificially constrained the housing supply. And when you do that, the long-term effect, and it has been going on for a long time, is housing prices will rise. So, you know, the suggestion from a lot of us is that there needs to be a, a strategic relaxation and rewriting of some of the zoning laws so that we you build denser, uh, developments in appropriate places. And you see I that come, I'm, I'm on a zoning board and I got to say, it's hard when the developer asks for a five-story building and the people in the neighborhood say, that's too much because there are no five-story buildings in my neighborhood and you're changing the, you know, the character of my neighborhood. And so as a zoning person, you say, well, couldn't I get away with maybe a three-story building? And you say, well, it doesn't pencil out. So then I have to look to and say, well, why isn't the state, well, remember the beginning of this conversation where James said, well, the state offers vouchers. That's another way. So could we get there halfway with zoning 
halfway with density and get the other half of the way there with subsidies for rents? Is anybody I, trying a combination of these things or is it all one way or the other? I, I don't think it's one way or another. And I don't think the vouchers get you halfway there, but um, I, I think change is hard, John. I mean, I think that's part of it. It's like the the evolution of zoning regulations is is very behind, right? Things move slowly at the government level, but you have this pressing need when you see the affordability crisis playing out at all different levels and all kinds of housing, right? And at different income levels too, even. There's just a, there's a, a dearth of housing at pretty much every price point. Um, but I don't think any one thing will do it. I think the, the, the ADU laws that are being enacted in a lot of states and almost everywhere, they're at least looking at it and, and relaxing. I think that's all going towards uh, addressing the, the core of the problem, which is um, the lack of supply. And I don't think it's going to be any one answer in any of this. You know, it's not going to be an 830G is not going to solve it all. The ADU laws aren't going to solve it all. Vouchers aren't going to solve it all. I think it's going to be a combination of a lot of things, but people getting their head around the need for change and local zoning kind of working with developers and housing advocates to sort of help make this happen. So no one solution, no magic bullet, um, but I think it's going to be a combination of a large number of things over a long period of time because we got into this situation um, over decades and uh, it's going to take a while to build our, our way out of it. So, James, let's go back to New York. I'm going to pull up this map uh, of what, 37 properties that you're your, in your portfolio. Are any of these affordable? Is there an affordable strategy in New York? Because affordable, uh, and New York's one of the most expensive markets in the country. Right. So a lot of the multifamily uh, that we sell, uh, if it was pre-war, uh, has rent regulation uh, as, as part of it. So uh, might be rent stabilized, might be rent control. Um, so Yes, I mean, you, you get these buildings that that have a mix. Uh, we also sell some newer construction properties that have, uh, that when they were built, they took advantage of that 421A program that we talked about, where in exchange for that tax abatement, they produced the 30% affordable housing. So and investors like that because they say, okay, well, I, I, this is very predictable. I know where the rents are. I can underwrite what the, the cap rate is, what the return is, and then I know what my taxes are going to be for the next 35 years, right? So we, we, we absolutely offer these. Um, we also sell land. Um, and, and as I mentioned, once the 421A expired, uh, we did not see any demand for market rate rental, Okay. We, I didn't mention that, yes, there is demand to, to, um, to build fully affordable, okay? But that's, that's all based on what kind of subsidies that you can get. And the challenge is that there's so much demand, um, you know, for, for, for um, this financing that now, uh, because the state only has a certain amount of cap uh, available every year, and so you get these waiting lists for two, three, five years, right? So... Um, because no one has been able to build this market rate housing in the middle, it really becomes the barbell where we're either selling land for luxury condos or on the other extreme, fully affordable, right? And so um, there, there is some activity on that, that side as well for the fully affordable, but these deals take a long time to close because the developers are saying, well, I can buy the site now, but then I have to sit here and wait three or four years to try to get the financing to to accomplish it. So this 485X, James, do you just predicting forward, is it going to be effective, do you think? Well, if you listen to the comments from uh, Jim Whalen, the head of the real estate board in New York, his commentary was he thought it was a missed opportunity for housing in New York. I, I think the concern is, uh, again, if we're looking to solve for 500,000 housing units, we're not going to get there with you know 50 unit projects 100 unit projects we really have to focus on these large scale developments and for 150 plus units the levels of affordability really ratcheted up as did uh, the labor costs so part of this arrangement to finalize is going to have a, an agreement between the real estate board and the unions and so 
again, some of these projects, again, are, are not going to pencil. When you look at the levels of affordability that are going to be required um, in, you know, Manhattan, waterfront, Brooklyn, Queens, and, and then, um, again, the cost of land, right? Because you're competing for that land with developers who will put luxury condos, right? So you're trying to, you know, can we level the playing field, right? That's what the state should be doing. How do we level the playing field so a rental developer who's providing affordable housing can compete with a condo developer, okay? Not going to happen on Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue, but, you know, Murray Hill, right? The financial district. In some of these areas where you would probably say the condo market is oversaturated, um, these are neighborhoods where we should be building rental. But again, we do the numbers and we look and, and we need to analyze this latest um, uh, proposal uh, or, or not even a proposal. Now, now it's moving t towards um, uh, to being signed in a, a, as a bill. Uh, our sense is that this program is only going to really work to deliver housing as you go further out from Manhattan. Um Waterfront, yes. Brooklyn, Queens. So, yes, could this work in Jamaica, Queens? You know, probably. The far Rockaways, sure. But we need housing everywhere. So um, it did not seem, uh, again, just the feedback we've gotten so far is that this program is just um, financially, it's not going to work for the larger projects. It's a little better once you get 150 under, you know, units because uh, they're not going to have the same requirements for the labor costs. They're not going to have as deep level of affordability. But again, building 50, 100 unit buildings, that that's not going to get us to where we need to be. Peter, when I ask the head of uh, affordable housing in New Canaan and I say, it's very hard in this town, like the other 140 towns in Connecticut, it's very hard in this town to identify a spot that is both walkable, as Paul Stone mentioned, and is on the, the town water and town sewer and walkable, but large enough to support uh, a big, dense uh, housing. So why don't we uh, spread this in single units, two units here, two, uh, duplex here, triplex here, duplex here? And the answer I got from the Affordable Housing Committee or the uh, was... It's too hard to manage 30 or 40, you know, units spread across the entire town. Now, obviously, the average citizen would rather not have 30 units next to them. They would rather mm -hmm. we spread this across the entire town. But he said it's too hard to manage it. But yet you told me that you're working primarily in the affordable space of single family units. How do you manage 30, 50, 100 affordable units across a great big geography? Sure. Well, uh, technology is definitely um, the answer. You know, the uh, I think maybe 15, 20 years ago, the, the question was, how do you how do you do that? You know, and, and there wasn't the advancements in technology there is today. Um, but now our invest our tenants have uh, portals that they can log into and they can give us uh, you know, send a ticket in and, you know, put what issue they're having or whatever it is. That goes to our property head of property management. He communicates with our uh, construction crew to see who's where and uh, who can go over and do that. And so I, I think it's a combination of, you know, the scale is definitely an important factor of it. You know, if if similar to multifamily, if you have a thousand units in single family, it's actually going to be easier to manage in some ways because you can, you at that point, there's efficiencies, there's economy of scale created. You can hire good people in house. Um, it's just different. I mean, whereas like a mom and pop or an individual person, you know, they might, they might struggle managing 10 units or something like that. You look at institutional buyers when they go into a market, they usually want to buy at least 750 homes right off the bat, if not closer to. 1500 because that allows for them to bring the construction in-house to bring the property management in-house they don't need to outsource that to another company that's managing thousands of other units but what you know and that could be multifamily it could be other you know single family portfolios so when you're doing it in-house obviously you're going to care about your assets more than a third party company is uh, you don't have i've worked at companies where they outsource asset management physical you know like property management and it's constant struggle with you know who's the biggest fish that they're managing for and that person's going to be screaming at them the loudest so when you're doing it in-house that's a great way to do it so i think it's a combination of 
having the the technology, you know, I think that goes back to our previous conversation where it's just, it's a lot of misconceptions. I think people don't realize the advancements in technology have made that a lot easier. And then when you have your own crews and you have enough scale to be able to send guys over to, to fix this problem or that problem isn't that big of a deal. Um, but if you have to outsource it to another company, your price is going to be through the roof. Nobody wants to go anywhere nowadays for under, you know, it depends on the trade, but you know, you send a plumber somewhere, they want 125 bucks just to show up. You know what I mean? So uh, if you're operating a smaller business and you have to outsource that, it's going to be difficult and not not as efficient economically. Um, but I, I think the answer is technology. You look at invitation homes and and Tricon and American Homes for Rent, their man, their port single family portfolios are a hundred close to a hundred thousand doors. And you know, they, they want to continue to scale. They have a hard time finding new product for them to buy. Um, so they're managing it, uh, you know, and sometimes they don't have the best reputations with how they're they're managing it. Um, so it's important that that as a company, you're you're expanding your portfolio in a way that you can provide a great uh, experience to your tenants because it's good to provide the housing, but if they're having a horrible experience, you know, if if there's mice or if there's a, a leak or you know the toilet's not working or whatever, th then what is it all worth at, at the end of the day? I mean, so to be able to to do things in house. Um, to have good technology, I think that's really the, you know, it's a marriage between those two things to be able to to do it. And, you know, we do, this is our full-time job. I mean, this is what we do. So we've been able to find ways to do it. And uh, there's companies a lot larger than us doing a lot bigger, bigger projects than we are. I'm wondering about this. I'm fascinated with this concept that seems to be only in New York of rent control. I can't imagine passing a law here that says everybody has to freeze their rents. You can't you can't raise your rents. When did that happen? Um, when did that start as a concept in New York? And how has it been able to perpetuate for decades as the preferred solution in New York City? Well, th there's a very easy answer to that, which is that there's more tenant voters than landlords, right? So if you run on the platform of, you know, vote for me and I'll freeze your rent, that, that seems to go over pretty well uh, until you're one of those people that didn't inherit the, the property, the, the unit from uh, your, your grandmother, so to speak. So, um, yeah, I mean, rent control, rent stabilization, those were never meant to be permanent uh, programs. Those those were uh, programs that were put together as kind of emergency relief during wartime. Right. And th there's actually um, a lawsuit that's been trying to find its way to the Supreme Court, which is um, affordable housing is really the job of the of government, the public sector, and you're forcing this on to the private sector without due compensation. So what happened? So, you know, and the argument against that is, well, you bought into this system, you knew that it was subject to the rules of um, the Department of Housing and Community Renewal, but what happened in 2019 was it used to be, okay, we well, can buy these stabilized units, but once they vacate, you can do the work and you can decontrol and charge a market rent. But then the city just came in and said, that's it. We're freezing rents, right? Well, or whatever increase you get every year. Discouraging but that, further it, investment. I mean, exactly. So and so, you know, what happened was there, I mean, apartment values, you know, going from, if you had a fully regulated building, after 2019, that building lost its, half its value because you no longer had that upside potential. And so you're right. It scares away investment. Uh, landlords aren't putting money into their units and they're saying, well, hey, I'm going to go to a friendly, you know, uh, a business friendly state. I don't need to be doing business here in New York. I'll, I'll go to Florida. Right. So your the, income the, the, doesn't the, increase, but your taxes do. You see. Right. Yeah. The, 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 the biggest travesty right now, and there, there's not, a, it's crazy that there's not an exact unit count. There's somewhere between 20 to 40,000 apartments in New York City right now that are empty. Why? Because that stabilized unit tenant left, right? Let's say they were paying $800 a month for that apartment. The way that the current, you know, what that 2019 legislation said was, you can actually only increase, you can only get credited for $15,000 of work that you do to that apartment. That's going to get you an $84 a month increase in the rent. But if you have someone who's been living in that apartment for 25, 30 years, and, and Peter can speak, I mean, 
you're not doing anything for 15,000 uh, mm -hmm. total. So why would I spend 75 to a hundred thousand dollars to renovate a unit if I'm only going to get an $84 a month increase, like do the math, I'll never get it back. Right. So it's actually cheaper to leave the units vacant, which is a real travesty. And, and by the way, as part of this, um, you know, good cause eviction is what the, this, we haven't even, I didn't even mention this before, but it wasn't just the, the tax abatement for new construction. The trade-off that, that has happened is we are getting good cause eviction in New York, which means, um, and some call it universal rent control, but fair market units now, you will not be able to increase an existing tenant's rent more than 10%, the, the lesser of 10% or 5% over CPI. CPI is three and a half percent. So yes, you, you, you give me a face, which is, I mean, th this is all happening right now as we speak, right? And so every time, and, and look, for the existing tenants, you know, great. You, you just, you know, sure, your, your, your fair market rent is going to be locked in unless if you're paying a certain rent. So there is luxury thresholds where they say we don't need to protect someone who's paying, you know, 4,000 plus a month for a studio, right? But again, this is just, in my opinion, this is one more reason why an investor would say, why am I taking the financial risk to borrow money and deal with this if I don't have the ability, I mean, are you going to cap my expenses? Are you going to tell me that my real estate taxes aren't going to go up? Are you going to cap my insurance, which is double or tripled in the last couple of years? No one's talking about that. So, you know, I have some pretty big concerns about what's going to happen. But unfortunately, with, with, with you know, the passing of this, I, I think it's going to make things only more challenging here. We've got only a few more minutes left. I guess we should look forward. I mean, this has been kind of bad news. I mean, I thought I had a solution there where I just go rent control, like wave the magic rent control wand and solve all my problems. But that didn't sound so good. So can we look forward and you give me some right. good news? Is there a way to solve my affordable housing problems, both in Greenwich and New York City and Baltimore? Take well, me out you, on you, a high you, note, yeah, guys. No, no, I and, and I'm, you know, <laughs> as brokers, we have to be the eternal optimist, right? So, um, look, and my friends in Greenwich might not, you know, this might not be a popular statement of what needs to happen, but, right, it's all about if you remove the barriers, right, of, of density, right? So if you remove that cap, the answer is more. So if we can build more housing, then rents are going to go down across the board. Okay. Here's an opportunity. If you look up the regional plan association, they looked at Westchester, they looked at Fairfield County and guess what? They said, we don't need these gigantic parking lots that are right adjacent to Metro North. Right? So if you have transit oriented development, why are we not allowing large scale development. And that's you're starting to see that in, in New Rochelle and White Plains, where right on top of the, 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 the train station, you're seeing large scale development. So um, look, that's the answer. We got to figure out how to build more housing. The more controls that you put on it, uh, the less that the private sector is going to rise to the occasion. So uh, I, I hope, uh, you know, lifting this 12 FAR cap, it's a step in the right direction for New York City. And hopefully we'll, we'll see some more policies put in place that really incentivize public private partnerships. Peter, you got I completely, completely agree. No, I, I couldn't agree with him more. You know, it really does seem like the answer. Uh, you know, we just we need more housing. So eliminating the barriers to creating more housing, doing it responsibly, getting information out there to people to fight any barriers they have mentally or around, uh, you know, the problems that come along with eliminating those barriers and creating more density um, certainly seems like a, a positive way and and, a, and maybe the only way to create more housing. If, if, and that's really the answer. So completely agree with James. Yeah, I was about to run for mayor and tell all of Paul Stone's tenants that I was going to cap their rent for the next 20 years. <laughs> um, but it doesn't sound like such a good idea if I want to encourage more, more development. And uh, so it's no. tough. So what did you learn today, Roberto? This went really fast. I have so many other questions. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, I, I'm actually curious, I and mean, we don't have the time, but I'm just curious because the tendency of affordable housing 
has to be substantially longer than a fair market. And how does the, pro the property degradate over time because you can't get into the apartments. And you, by the time someone does eventually leave, it is like a full gut renovation. It's not just a quick little, you know, where you can continue to maintain things. It's gotta be part of the equation for investors when they come in, et cetera, so. We're out of time. I think we're gonna have to do a whole nother hour on the question of affordable housing. We should put this on the calendar. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Thank you Peter Neal. Thank you, James Nelson. This has been a really great yeah. and very Thanks. fast hour yeah. and uh, an important subject. So really thank you very it. much. And uh, we'll see you on the next, uh, on part two coming up. Yes. Thanks guys. Really Looking appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Great all. to be here.